Day Centre and by uh, CSIS, but it has one flaw, and that is there's too much of it. So um, that's going to impose unbelievable discipline on those of us who are both moderators and, and speakers at this gathering. We have a really distinguished group here to discuss politics and security in an emerging Asia. I, about 15 years ago, a great Australian academic, Coral Bell, wrote a superb article on, uh, on global developments at that point. And she said this about the international political system. For the first time in recorded history, we are experiencing the rise of something like 14 new powers to economic power and prosperity. And the difference between the system now and previous systems lies both in the numbers that are rising, but also their circumstances. The first time these sorts of powers have arisen where there has been no settlement of the disputes between them. In other words, they're rising, their power is growing, they're developing a capacity to knock not inwards in their national security policies, but outwards, and uh, the, with the capacity to develop the ability to project outwards, but they have not resolved the issues between them. And in the region that uh, we're discussing here today, that is now so obvious. There is not a single agreed maritime boundary uh, between countries in the entire archipelago, uh, nor is there apparently agreed boundaries to the north of it. No agreed boundaries, security issue automatically. There's been, I think, two developments, and I, as a moderator, I don't intend to speak at any length, so I'll just say this in the last two decades that we need to pay notice of. The first is um, the new player in the system over the last two decades, in the first instance, or the first of those two decades is China. Uh, China's participation is a product of a geopolitical shift which occurred within a country, off the border with the old Soviet Union, Russia, with a delimitation of uh, military arrangements on those two borders. That was the biggest movement of armed force as a result of a peace agreement in the 20th century and uh, completely changed the character of the PLA when that occurred. It went from being essentially a, uh, a ground-based operation for very heavy ground operations, vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union, then Russia, to being one which had to seriously contemplate maritime issues and to restructure itself in order to do that, and it is still going through that process. The second big shift occurred with the overturning of the Nixon Doctrine. The Nixon Doctrine in 1969 effectively ruled the United States out of Southeast Asia. And uh, when they in, explicitly in Guam, President Nixon identified that as a zone in which the United States expect its friends to, in the first instance, look after themselves. President Obama doctrinally turned that on his head, its head when he talked about the involvement as uh, the pivot or the rebalance to the Asia-Pacific region as a for American force structure determinant and as an area in which the United States would engage its military power in pursuit of its political objectives. Those are two sea changes in the, uh, in the politics uh, of the region, and, of course, they are two changes which, uh, along with the phenomenon that Coral Bell referred to, um, basically underpin or underlie uh, any analysis of the politics and security in an emerging Asia. We've got a fantastic panel here. Um, our, our starting speaker will be Andrew Shearer. He is a, a, very, a man very well experienced in affairs in this country, having served at the embassy across the way. He's senior advisor now in the office of the Prime Minister on national security. Admiral Gary Ruffhead, a former chief of uh, naval operations for the United States. Michael Green, who you've already seen and Alan Gingell, who is a former Director General of the Office of National Assessments. So we'll each speak for five, five or six minutes, and then there may be time for questions after that. Andrew. Well, thank you, Kim. Um, it's great to be back in Washington, D.C., although it's a little colder than it was in Australia when we left. Um, I'd like to thank you, Kim, uh, for all the support the Embassy's given me for my visit, and also I'd like to thank uh, CSIS. It's great to be back here in your very impressive new building, and. Uh, 
and also the US Studies Centre, uh, Robert Hill and Bates Gill, thank you. Uh, I'm not, you're, you'll be relieved to hear, I'm not going to try a, a kind of review of the region, um, but I am going to talk a little bit about how I think some of the, uh, some of the factors that, that Kim summarised very well are affecting Australia. Uh, in particular, I'm struck coming back to government after six or seven years outside uh, by the, the sheer pace of strategic change and how quickly uh, that strategic change has moved closer to Australia. We used to talk in Australia of the tyranny of distance uh, if, if, you, if, if you think the glass is half, half empty or perhaps uh, strategic depth, how far we were from, uh, from the epicentre of most world uh, competition and conflict. But um, my experience of just the last few months is that, that uh, as the, the locus of global power shifts closer to our region, Australia has become much closer to the major fault lines in in global politics, and that's affecting us in material um, ways. Of course, for, for, for similar reasons, the US has been undertaking its, its rebalance to Asia, and there's been some discuss, discussion this morning and voting on that. Uh, I think it's interesting that the Abbott government's also doing its own uh, rebalance, if you like, um, and the Prime Minister likes to talk about a foreign policy characterised as, uh, as more Jakarta and less Geneva. Um, it's... it's uh, it's, of course, a simplification, but it's pointing, I think, to more of a focus on our immediate region and some of the key bilateral relationships. So we're doing our own, we're own, reba our own rebalance. Um, we've certainly had lots of Jakarta in recent weeks, um, thanks to uh, Mr Snowden, um, and, uh, and also some complicated issues to do with... Uh, uh, asylum seeker policy and our determination to stop boats um, breaching Australian sovereignty. But, but I've been struck in, in, in the sort of uh, immersed as I have been in the day-to-day -day complexity of those issues uh, by the fact that we're dealing with an increasingly strong Indonesia, uh, whereas for decades Australia has, I think, dealt with challenges arising from a, from a weaker and more fragile Indonesia. And I think uh, we're only going to see more of this, uh, and it's going to be it's going to it's going to be challenging for both sides. Uh, despite that, I think this is a relationship with huge potential. Uh, the prime minister sees it very much in those terms, and I think that um, we can negotiate this this difficult little period and put put the relationship back on track to be a, a much stronger and more broadly based strategic partnership than uh, than what we see uh, today. I think the other area uh, that Kim mentioned that, that, that's really um, come home to me is, is the, the sharpness of the strategic tensions that we're seeing play out in, in North Asia. I mean, there's nothing new to strategic competition, of course, in that region, uh, but the intensity of them, I think, um, uh, has reached a, a new level. We made, I think, um, a reasonably mild public statement about our concerns when China announced its air defence identification zone uh, and um, uh, we, that generated, I thought, a, a surprisingly robust uh, reaction from Beijing. Um, uh, a series of other decisions taken by the government, um, the reaffirmation of the previous government's decision to ban Huawei from our national broadband network, um, uh, some closer steps with Japan. All of these things uh, have, have generated in, in Beijing's mind at least a sense that Australia is in some way shifting its policy on, on China, which is not the case. But again, it, it just reminded me that we're walking through a very sort of delicate minefield in North Asia. Um, at the same time, Relations between Japan and China, two of our most critical economic markets, are very fraught. Uh, Japan's relations with Korea, another vital market for Australia, are also exceptionally difficult. So you've got this brew of tensions and disputes uh, among three of uh, our most important economic uh, partners in North Asia, uh, which again points, I think, to a much more challenging 
uh, environment for Australia to, to navigate. So what's our response to this? Um, I think it lies in uh, continuing to strengthen and deepen our relations with traditional partners. Uh, we will continue to build our strategic relationship with Japan. We want to sign a free trade agreement with Japan. We want to develop our relationship with South Korea. We have already concluded an FTA with South Korea. Uh, and, and we want a pragmatic, strong relationship with China, uh, focused very much on areas of common interest, uh, particularly the economy, and, and there too we're seeking to, to conclude uh, an FTA. The Alliance, though, has a, has a place in all of this, I think. Um, uh, we see a very strong strategic convergence uh, as the US rebalances towards our region. We think that this is going to be a long-term trend. We don't think this is a new thing under this administration, and we think it will continue under future administrations. Uh, uh, and we... Um, uh, I think it's interesting, Kim alluded to this, that in recent years our, our deployments, our military deployments under the Alliance have been in the Middle East. I think we're going to see the... the alliance become, in a sense, more regional and much more focused on maintaining the regional order uh, and the maritime balance in the Western Pacific uh, as it comes under growing strain. And that, too, will, will have uh, uh, consequences for Australia. I think um, the situation we're facing points to Australia and the United States working much, uh, much more closely together to strengthen regional institutions like the East Asia Summit, uh, and the ASEAN Defence Minister's meeting. I think it points to us uh, trying to bring in other regional partners to our bilateral cooperation, partners like Japan and South Korea, uh, Indonesia, India, perhaps Vietnam. I think it points to the Alliance having a heavier maritime focus than it has in recent years. I think we'll see further cooperation in space and cyber. And I think that... Um, you'll see us moving to expedite uh, implementation of President Obama, uh, Obama's initiative to, uh, to rotate US forces through Northern Australia. I think um, we'll be looking at, at further phases in that as well. And then lastly, uh, for Australia, I think it, 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 it points to the need for us to restore uh, a sound, adequate level of defence funding. Uh, there, there were significant defence cuts over previous years. Our defence capability plan has not been approved by government since 2009, and we face a series of very major defence acquisition decisions on submarines, uh, the Joint Strike Fighter and replacement frigates, and all of this, of course, against the backdrop of, uh, of um, revenue uh, de declining and very a very tight fiscal outlook as was underlined by the recent economic statement in Australia. So it won't be easy and we will be tackling all of these problems in a defence white paper which we have uh, committed to deliver in the first year and a half. I'll leave it there. Thanks very much, Andrew. If we could proceed straight to Gary. Okay. Well, thank you very much and it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to continue the discussion uh, with the Alliance 21. Um, I'm not a latecomer to uh, the U.S.-Australian alliance, and as proof of that, uh, my 14-year-old Labrador retriever, Clancy, is named after Clancy of the Overflow. <laughs> so my Australian friends get it. The Americans have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, but um, as, as Kim mentioned, so much of, of what we're dealing with in the region really is going to be maritime. And I think in terms of maritime as boundaries, flows, expansion, and resources. The boundaries, as uh, you mentioned, are all contested. Uh, they're going to be continued to be pressed uh, by China. Uh, the one that to me is the most volatile is the East China Sea because the, the, the power of the nationalism on both sides is pretty extraordinary. And I think that's really one to watch. Um, the ADIS move, in my view, I think that was step one. I would not uh, be surprised if there's an ADIS uh, declaration in the South China Sea, how they will play it, uh, to be determined, but 
Um, that is the nature of, I think, how these boundaries will play out. With regard to the flows, the resources coming out of the Middle East are going to be extraordinarily important uh, to Asia and to China. Uh, China's view of a 21st century maritime Silk Road that goes through the Indian Ocean is going to be interesting to watch between India and China, because as you know, India thinks that that ocean is very appropriately named, and so there may be some, uh, some issues that arise there. The expansion of the maritime domain uh, will take place when the new ocean is more open, and that's the Arctic. Um, more resources will be available there, zinc, copper, iron, um, and, and Asia will need those resources. So what does all that mean? And that means that there's going to be a demand for greater capacity, and how do you cover, and how do you support and work together with the allies in the region? And so I think that, that this is what we're going to be looking at for the next uh, decade or two. There's no question that the PRC will continue to build their maritime capabilities. I've been watching it now for a couple of decades. Uh, they are growing in capability and in capacity, and, and we will be competing with them in a security sense. Uh, but there are also opportunities for cooperation. Uh, for the past four years, we've been doing daily naval operations with the PLA Navy. It's called counter piracy. Uh, they'll be joining for the first time ever the Rim of the Pacific exercise. So there will be competition, but there will also be opportunities for cooperation. If we can get that balance right, I think that's a, extremely important for the region. With regard to uh, U.S. capabilities, uh, it's very easy to look at our messy budget environment and, and, and say, you know, where are we going? But, um, you know, in, in Washington, uh, you know, it's always good uh, to be a bit pessimistic because you never met, meet a disappointed pessimist. You know, they're always uh, upbeat. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm actually encouraged by what's happened here recently. As the CNO uh, went through my entire tour with no budget process that was followed. Uh, we now have about two years of, of relative predictable budget stability. And if you look at um, what is coming onto the scene right now, a new Joint Strike Fighter, the most capable airplane in the world, and will, it will be the best sensor in the battle space. A new maritime patrol and anti-submarine warfare airplane. A new class of submarines that will have added to it the Virginia uh, payload modules for strike, for what I believe will be an increasing number of unmanned underwater systems that will be husbanded from those boats. Uh, ballistic missile defense, new airborne early warning systems, initiatives in cyber that will be so important as we go into the future, and of course, the unmanned capabilities that are being introduced. And when you talk about this expanding maritime domain and the challenges that we'll face from a security standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, uh, from a, uh, as, as you well know, the migration standpoint, that type of capability where you can have it up for hours and hours and hours is going to make a huge difference. And so these are things that are coming. These are things that are in the budget. And so, uh, you know, we're not out of the woods. We have some systemic issues within the defense budget where we're kind of eating ourselves from within because of compensation and medical and what have you. All that has to get fixed, no question about it. But things don't look too bad. Um, so what does that mean and how can we uh, take a look at these together? And I would say that we should look at the capabilities and the process that we're going after uh, building joint capabilities, because there are no two militaries, in my view, who have adopted and who have perfected jointness to the level that the United States and Australia have done. So there's a natural compatibility there and a, and a, and a, and a common way of looking at things. So how do we come at that together? I think there can be better coordination in that regard more personnel uh, interaction. Uh, we have in the U.S. a kind of anachronistic exchange program where we send one, you send one. I think we have to have a much more fluid way of having our people move in and out of each other's units, share ideas. As we both pursue uh, advanced air defense with Aegis Weapons System, as we look at submarine warfare of the future, as we look at space and cyber, as we look at the potential for a networked um, set of nodes to do uh, maritime domain awareness, 
I really think we need to look at how can we come together and create in respective countries centers of excellence for amphibious warfare, for example, anti-submarine warfare, where our people are assigned together, where they think, where they come up with ideas and put in place plans for how our forces will work together all the time, not just sporadically during exercise periods or planning sessions, but that these actually become nodes where we are really integrated. I think those are some of the areas where we can uh, work more closely together and take advantage of some of the technology that we'll be having delivered to us and that we'll be giving to the terrific young people of both of our countries to go and do the hard work that our countries ask of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Admiral. Uh, Michael. Um, thank you. I mentioned in the earlier panel that I didn't buy the China choice thesis that we have to fundamentally, or Australia has to fundamentally rethink its, its interests in the Asia-Pacific region, and also that there was far more continuity than change in the Obama administration's um, re rebalance to the Asia-Pacific. So let me briefly um, contradict myself uh, by pointing to a few areas where I think we, we do have some change and we do have to pick up our game. Uh, first. I would uh, agree with Kim's historical observation that uh, what we're doing now in Southeast Asia is, in many respects, a reversal of Nixon's 1969 Guam Doctrine. Um, now, the Guam Doctrine was about pulling substantial hundreds of thousands of U.S. military forces out of Southeast Asia. What we're putting back in is extremely modest in comparison, but what's, I think, new and, and is perhaps the most important part of the rebalance, because it will be sustained, is the sustained focus on Southeast Asia as a strategic region. And Ernie Bauer and his program at CSIS have been an instrumental part of that. Um, the military dimension will be limited uh, because almost all of these countries within ASEAN want to continue having good economic and political relations with China, but having a security uh, blanket from the US and absolutely do not want to be forced to choose. So we'll be doing incremental things, small level engagement, strategic dialogues. It's not going to be revolutionary, but the, the discipline in our engagement will be very important. And we're going to go back, hopefully, to what the US wanted to do in Southeast Asia uh, in the 1950s, uh, when Nixon was vice president. Um, and that was to start having some cohesion and cooperation among Southeast Asian states so that they're a bulwark against great power intervention, communist, and now um, Jemai Lee and other terrorist uh, influences. So we, the US and Australia, have to not only pick up our game bilaterally, not only military, militarily, which would be one piece of this, we need to work together with other like-minded states to help ASEAN uh, become more cohesive and more resistant to great power intervention. Uh, Northeast Asia is much harder. I don't think that the rebalance has um, had a Northeast Asian flavor. I say this as a, a Japan and Northeast Asia guy by training. Um, the Admiral and Andrew both mentioned the East China Sea and the challenges. I saw in the Japanese papers this morning that the Defense Ministry announced that so far um, this year, uh, the Japan Air Self-Defense Forces have had to scramble fighter jets 79% um, more, more, more times than last year, which was already up over the year before. So the, the velocity and the um, tempo of operations in that region um, is growing, it's, it's almost exponential. Um, and the physics of this are extremely worrying in spite of the grow, you know, enormous economic interdependence between Japan and China. We in Washington, I think, uh, have not settled on the strategy to handle this. I think we are still uh, uh, uncertain. Um, as you listen around town, as you talk to people in the administration, um, there are some who think the answer is to contain Japan and to keep Japan down. Um, uh, because China's military rise and power is inevitable and Japan is unpredictable. The other uh, viewpoint, which I would strongly associate myself with, is that the answer to this problem is not to distance ourselves from Japan, or might, one might add the Philippines, um, but in fact to make ourselves more joint, interoperable, um, and the reason is that um, increasing jointness and interoperability with our allies, uh, in this case particularly Japan, reassures them. It gives us more influence over decision-making, escalation control, and adds to the dissuasion and deterrence effect uh, against the China, which is pushing uh, the boundaries a bit and seeing what it can do. And the corollary to that is we need to be doing this not only bilaterally, but networking across alliances. So what Andrew and his colleagues are doing with Japan is, is critical to U.S. interests, very, very important. 
And we need to move beyond just defense dialogue and exercises. We need to be thinking about joint development of weapon systems, what um, our boss John Hamry calls a federated uh, system of defense capabilities, even though we don't have collective security in a formal sense, in terms of capabilities with declining budgets, we need to be thinking in that direction. Which finally leads China, we'll spend a lot of time on China all day. Since Richard Nixon, every US president, no matter what they said during the election, has tried to expand cooperation with China, and every president has basically succeeded in doing that. And that hasn't changed, and going into the future, uh, uh, this president and the next president will have to find the right formula to describe um, our uh, interest and the region's interest in the U.S. and China cooperating more, trusting each other more, doing some of the military-to-military -military engagement that um, Gary Ruff had said. We're going to have to find the right way to frame that, though, and uh, we've, not, we've not found that formula. The administration has embraced publicly uh, President Xi Jinping's so-called new model of great power relations with the intent of demonstrating a readiness to expand cooperation with China. But we have to be extremely careful in this town not to signal, and in this case, I think accidentally the administration has, that we have some interest in a kind of uh, dialogue with China about how to reorder the region um, towards more of a bipolar US-China condominium. Uh, ever since Richard Nixon opened up to China, um, our friends and allies, not just the Japanese, but especially the Japanese, have worried about this. And we, we just haven't found the right way to talk about it and formulate it. In all of this, I think, um, and these are big strategic decisions in the sense that we have to get it right. It's not a black and white decision. We have to find the right formulas and consistency, which we're struggling with. I think Australia has a role in this. <clears throat> when I was in the NSC, um, uh, Michael Fawley, Andrew Shearer were essentially, I hope this doesn't get you in trouble, but essentially a part of our process. Um, I'd go to a colleague at DOD uh, to make a case for a strategy, and they'd say, yeah, I already talked to Andrew. Uh, I'd go to brief the National Security Advisor, they'd say, yeah, yeah, I already talked to Michael Fawley. <clears throat> um, at first, it worried me. I thought I'd become redundant and would lose my job. In the end, I realized it was how alliances should work. Um, we don't always work that way, but I think that's, that's what we need to do with Australia, and I think that's what we need to do with all our allies going forward. Thank you very much, Michael, and finally, Alan. Um, Thanks. Could I just begin with, a, on a personal note, when I was on think tank training wheels trying to set up the Lowy Institute in Australia, there was no person in this business uh, who was more generous with his uh, time or had more practical and canny advice for me than, uh, than John Hamry. Uh, it was a real... Um, uh, he showed me what a great think tank it could be, so it's uh, really wonderful to be, after seeing the plans in John's office for many years, to be in this wonderful building, which is a tribute to his leadership and to CSIS's position in Washington. Uh, look, I thought I'd uh, talk more about the management of the Australia-US um, uh, uh, alliance in these new circumstances uh, where Asia becomes more central to uh, to US uh, interests and to the overall relationship. Um, sensibly enough, most Australians don't think very much about uh, international policy. They don't have to. But they have three broad convictions in their mind, I think, which all governments have to, uh, uh, have to take notice of or, or be punished. One is governments have to manage the US alliance well uh, secondly, they have to maintain effective relations with the key, our key Asian neighbours. And third, they have to support Australia's position in a rules-based international order. Now, ordinary Australians don't th think about it in those terms, of course, but they do have a very strong sense that if you're Australia's size and located where you are in the world with our range of uh, interests, you can't get what you want by throwing your weight around. You're better served by, uh, uh, by a system which is uh, predictable and transparent, whether that's in trade or, uh, uh, or, uh, or, or uh, security. Um, now, I think you can, see, you can see the proxy for that, really, in, the, uh, in support in polling for the, uh, for the United Nations. I think that's really support for a rules-based uh, order. For most of the past decades, it's been very easy for Australian governments uh, to do this because our key Asian partners have been either allies of the United, uh, United States um, uh, uh, or, in the case of uh, China, uh, after Nixon, um, 
are, you know, uh, generally proceeding in the, uh, in the same direction. And the rules-based order was one which the United States uh, and its uh, friends had established and, uh, and uh, supported. So keeping all three aligned was not, uh, not difficult. But it's now going to be much harder, especially as China demands more from its uh, trading partners and the norms of the rules-based uh, order uh, are, uh, are challenged by rising powers. Similarly, during the Cold War, uh, although the central struggle against the Soviet Union was very Im important to Australia, there were few areas where Australia had cross-cutting uh, uh, distinct national interests uh, involved. And then as uh, the focus of alliance activities uh, moved to the Middle East, it was again not difficult for Australian policymakers to align themselves uh, with US interests because uh, independent Australian interests in the Middle East uh, were limited. That, however, is not the case in Asia, uh, especially in Southeast Asia, where Australia has very uh, direct interests. You can see this most clearly in the, uh, in the case of Indonesia, where there's quite a lot of uh, historical precedent. I was thinking about this. I, I actually can't think of an area in uh, international policy where Australia and US policy differences have emerged over the years more clearly than over Indonesia. That's not to say they've been great in, in any area, but the fact that there have been some uh, in Indonesia is, uh, is remarkable from the, uh, from the uh, uh, differences we had with President Kennedy over the Dutch East Indies uh, through our disagreements over the IMF's heavy conditionality uh, in Indonesia after the uh, Asian financial crisis to disagreements at the time of the East Timor intervention. Now, none of these threatened the alliance, went remotely close to threatening the alliance, but all were a source of irritation uh, in the relationship. As Asia becomes more central, there are going to be more of those uh, issues that will come up. Now, I don't think there's any way in which the alliance will come under pressure despite claims from some of the, uh, some of the commentary uh, in Australia, because on the Australian side, the uh, support for the alliance rests on two absolutely fundamental pillars. Uh, one is that both sides of Australian politics claim the origin story. Uh, Labor through the Curtin and the Second World War, the coalition through, uh, through Menzies and the Anzus Treaty. That's a terrific, uh, terrific uh, uh, thing. And secondly, uh, the alliance retains enormous deep public support, 80 to 85 per cent in, uh, in successive uh, low E polls, different from a more volatile response you get if you ask about relations with the US. So the alliance, where the insurance policy is the most powerful metaphor in Australian uh, public policy. So very strong, but it does need to be uh, worked at. It's understandably hard for a superpower to take account at the centre of its decision making of the interests of small allies. Lots of people in this town, many of them in, in this room, who know us well and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and to understand that. But, but right at the very centre, it's, it, it is understandably difficult. Um, so it will be important over the next uh, decades for the tools of the alliance, the existing management tools of the alliance, military cooperation, diplomacy, uh, intelligence, uh, even think tanks to be well-oiled and, uh, and operating effectively. And that's one reason alone why it's uh, good to be at this conference. Thank you. Well, that I'm sure you'll all agree was exemplary. Content filled, short, leaving uh, us with about 20 minutes worth of questions before the uh, coffee break. And exemplary performance there to be open to uh, for everybody else. So I'm going to start with a, a, a technical question to, to Gary, uh, Admiral Roughhead, and then we'll, uh, then we'll proceed to your questions. Um, and, I, and I've got to say, Alan brought to mind, as I, as I get older and older, my youth becomes more and more important. And uh, as uh, I can recollect when I joined the Labor Party, the... Um, 
the, the struggle around the origins of the American alliance was not a fight with the Liberal Party, it was a fight internally. Whitlam against the armed neutralists. And Whitlam used to use Curtin like a club against uh, them when it came to discussing what was a proper stance for a socialist. And uh, that was a, and, and so the, that's where the argument went. And then uh, was translated from that into an argument with the Liberals about origins. But there we are. I disagree with both the Liberal Party and the Labor Party's views. I think the Contemporary American Alliance was founded by McNamara. But we'll give that, uh, I'll give that a run at a, uh, at a later stage. Gary, the question to you is this. Uh, one of the things that struck me when I came here and I got rebriefed after years and years of not being briefed, the thing that struck me was over the last decade how much further the capacity of the American armed forces had moved ahead in technical capabilities of where they'd been 10 years previously. The gap, whatever the expenditures or armed forces numbers, the gap between the United States and its nearest peer competitors was greater when I came here than it had been 10 years earlier. And uh, it's not really well understood. That's not to say that the US isn't vulnerable to asymmetrical activity. But I think the asymmetrical activity that they'd be vulnerable to is more closed space activity in the Persian Gulf than uh, with, with, with suicide small boat operators not testing any of your surveillance capacities than it would be necessarily in the, uh, in the South China Seas. But having said that, you then look at the projections on the American defence budget, which have about 50% of it at the moment in personnel, but if nothing happens, within the next decade it'll be 75% and all those developments you, you talked about would be as naught. What do you think is going to happen? Um, I, I believe that we're going to see some movement. Um, we are hearing on the Hill more discussions and comments about the need to get after these systemic problems than I've ever seen before. There's no question this is very politically difficult, a difficult thing to do, but I do believe it's becoming apparent that it is unsustainable. So uh, the next couple of years are going to be telling, but, but it's moving in the right direction. I think it's important that we uh, put some options on the table that uh, are not frightening to the young people that are contemplating being in the military. We haven't done that. We talk about the fact that it has to change, but I think we have to put some ideas out there that are appealing to the generation that's serving today, and that can be done. Thanks very much. Right, now I'm looking for waving hands. Bates. Thanks very much. Um, Alan, you said something I found very intriguing. You, you, you started with the example of Indonesia as a place where the United States and Australia have had a number of differences over the years. But then you said, as Asia continues to emerge, and we should expect more of these sorts of differences to arise. Um, that's very interesting. Could you maybe just speculate about where those might be? With what countries or over what issues? Uh, it's a bit it's a bit hard to say, um, Bates. But but Australia, uh, the general point is that Australia will have a has a range of uh, distinct national interests uh, involved uh, right across Asia. Uh, Asia, uh, I, th I think, is uh, well. This is, this is not surprising. Asia is full of unfinished business. One of the bits of unfinished business, I think, is if you look across mainland Southeast Asia from Myanmar, Thailand, Malaysia, Cambodia, uh, uh, Vietnam, Vietnam, all of them have polities which have questions which are not yet resolved. Now, I don't know how these things will uh, uh, change. I think no one, no one does, but, uh, but I, th I think we're going to be in a more volatile Southeast Asia than we've been used to over the past uh, 10, 15 years anyway. And ranges of interests will, uh, different national interests will uh, come out of that. And it's therefore important, as I sort of ended by saying, that the, the management tools of the, uh, of the alliance are in uh, uh, well-oiled and in good repair. Thanks. The former Assistant Secretary.
<laughs> since I'm going to ask for speculation, and I know government officials don't speculate. Um, I've always been a supporter of the idea that Australia can have both the growing relationship with China economically and the security alliance with us. But as one of those pessimists referenced earlier, I'm starting to doubt myself. You know, when I look at the situation in the East China Sea in particular, but also the South China Sea, I find it slightly terrifying to look at all the number of ships out there in close quarters. You look at the number of air incursions, which was referenced, and I'm starting to think there's a 50% chance, and that's an arbitrary number, actually, that a significant military incident, I don't mean a full-scale conflict, could happen this year. And I'm wondering if that does, you know, it could easily involve the United States and make it more difficult for the United States and its allies to treat China the same way that it has all along. And that could even, depending on the seriousness of the incident, include on the economic side, and who knows the congressional response, of course. So I'd like to ask who's ever willing to speculate, you know, whether you, you know, in that scenario, one, whether you think I'm just too pessimistic, or two, what the implications might be for relations with China. That can pretty well run across anybody, so why don't you all try? Starting with Andrew. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Well, I, I agree okay. with you that um, I think the, the biggest uh, risk is in the East China Sea in the air. Uh, I really believe that at the, at the ship level, particularly the Coast Guards, quite frankly, I, I, I think both sides watch it very carefully. But as we've seen in the past, an air incident has the potential to really kick something off. Uh, the concern I have is that there's no mechanism for the two sides at the tactical, operational, and even at the national level to be able to de-escalate. And so the question will be, to your point, how do you walk back? I don't, I, I do believe there will be a walking back, but it will be very messy and there'll be a lot of breakage and damage as a result of it. Mike, you watch it more um, uh, yeah, no, I won't be fired. In fact, I'll be promoted if I speculate wildly at this place, so I'm happy to answer. <laughs> um, uh, I agree with the Admiral. The Coast Guards uh, are uh, quite careful about the rules of engagement, the two navies even more so. Um, but the Air Forces are a little wilder and newer to this game. I, I think the possibility of an accident or a collision is not trivial. I wouldn't say 50 percent, but, but, but you know, not trivial, 20 percent, something like that. <clears throat> I think the possibility of escalation to larger conflict is very, very low. Um, so the key thing in terms of regional security and stability is how the U.S. and allies respond when this crisis happens. And if we split, and if we clearly diverge in our answers across the alliances and partnerships we have in the region, it will send an absolutely devastating signal to China in terms of our resolve um, and the um, stickiness or the sustainability of current, current rules of the road. <clears throat> um, I, uh, like uh, the ambassador, I'm a military history, diplomatic history buff. In 1937-38, after Japan invaded, uh, began the war with China, um, the Admiralty in London proposed the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy send eight battle fleet sh ships jointly on a cruise through the Pacific, not to fight the Japanese, but to, deter to demonstrate that aggression would cause um, co a coalition. Um, and the U.S. Navy said, actually, some of the U.S. Navy wanted to do it, but the Hoover administration said no. And some Japanese historians have looked through the archives and said, had we done that, um, the rest of history in the Pacific might have been very different. So the key, I think, is um, we should be thinking through now in the U.S. government, with Australia, with others, not just our military contingency plans, but, but in general and in some specific terms, how we would handle this um, to make sure not only that there's no escalation, but that the right signals are sent uh, if something happens. Uh, no, I just enthusiastically agree with Michael. I, I think that's uh, ex expressed it admirably well. I think there's one interesting thing with it, uh, and that is that uh, we actually, you actually know where the collision point is in the East China Sea. You know, you know exactly where the focal point is of the contested views about where things should happen. Should the adders be repeated in the nine-dash line, and this is something the Chinese really need to comprehend, understand, that will run into a whole range of military activities by other powers, not just the United States. It'll run into us. We're responsible for Malaysia's air defence and we regularly surveil with all sorts of aircraft the South China Seas from that point. And it'll run into all the locals because that nine-dash line comes up so close to the coastlines, it'd be virtually impossible 
to operate military aircraft off your, in their normal, the normal course of their training activities, let alone surveillance, in a way that did not bring them across the border. And this, is not, this will not be focused. This will be multi-dimensional and multi-locales that uh, these things will occur. And they'll find themselves in a situation where they'll be effectively challenging a, a settlement of the Asian region in 1971 when um, we, we had two important developments. The development of ASEAN, which was basically an operation to give Indonesia satisfaction about the world in which it uh, immersed itself, because Indonesia was seen as a real problem or, 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 or containing or, or uh, catering to their nationalistic instincts. You needed a body that would do that. And secondly, how did you get a security situation for Malaysia and Singapore where it had been challenged by, ex internally by the uh, Malaysian Communist Party, externally by the, uh, by the Indonesians? And the, the people who were drawn, to, were drawn out of the hat to do the job were the Australians, technically British and New Zealanders but really the Australians, and it's really been the Australians ever since. And that's a, um, uh, now that's the settlement, but the settlement has consequences, and the consequences would run flush up against that nine dash line. More questions? Uh, Ernie, and then Russell. I just wanted to ask the panel, um, what do you think the prospects are for, if, if we're sitting here 10 years from now, um, and we're looking at the alliance, uh, will, will we understand uh, where India stands in terms of regional architecture better? Will we have, uh, will we sort of have a less sort of mystified sense of uh, a cohesive ASEAN? Uh, because I think these things are very important if you think about regional architecture and its, its value to the discussion that we're having. If we're gonna convince uh, China to sit at the table and make the rules with the rest of us and then play by those rules, uh, it seems to me that there's a certain genius and, you know, embedded somewhere in this regional architecture. Uh, alliances are key to make that work. But I find uh, myself a, a very frustrating state of, you know, that we're at, in 2014 and, and it's, we, we sort of can't answer these questions about India and ASEAN right now. And I just wonder if you could Tell, tell me where you think we'll be in 10 years and what we need to do to get to a good place in 10 years. Thank you. I'll throw that first to Andrew. Thanks, Ernie. Um, I'm not a, an India scholar, but uh, my hunch is that after this period of kind of, if you like, a slowdown in India's outreach, um, I, th I think it will resume a greater place. Um, my hunch, equally though, is it will always do it more slowly than we would like and in ways that will, um, from time to time, irritate us or frustrate us. Um, but I think, I think the trend is, is going to continue. And um, with regard to ASEAN, I think, um, despite having been perhaps a sceptic at different times, uh, again, I'm mildly optimistic. I think there are lots of forces that are actually tightening the, tightening the cohesion. Um, some of them are economic, and I think there has been real sort of genuine progress with economic integration in ASEAN. But then there's also the external motivation of the sort of world we've been talking about here this morning. So I'm cautiously optimistic. Anybody else want to tackle a question? Um, and I know you asked about India and ASEAN, but I think, you know, and it's easy to focus in on those two areas, but the thing that I believe bears watching is the evolution of Pakistan and South Asia and what that, what dynamic that creates. Pakistan is going to change dramatically. It will have economic problems. It will have resource problems. Uh, the nuclear issues associated in South Asia are significant. We're not talking about those. We're seeing shifts in in the nuclear world, if you will, both on the civil and military side. And 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 so the question I have is, what what will Pakistan spawn uh, if the disorder continues to move? And and then that will have uh, that will reverberate. So I think 
I think we really need to kind of step back and look at South Asia post-2014, the dynamic and what will fall out from that. I, could, I, could I just say that in response to Andrew's cautious optimism, I would be cautiously pessimistic uh, on, uh, on both fronts. Uh, I, think, uh, I think the magnetic pull for India is always going to be west uh, rather than uh, east, and, and Gary's uh, point is, uh, is very well made. I, I, uh, a combination of external uh, events on uh, Pakistan's western border and the internal governance problems which India, in, India has, I think, will make it a very slow player uh, uh, to, the, to the east. Um, and, and ASEAN, for reasons I... I said before, I'm, I, I have a, a more um, pessimistic uh, view of ASEAN's ability to, to get its act together because of all these unfinished uh, issues which I was uh, talking about before. Um, I was responsible for India on the NSC staff when I was there, and we, during the Bush administration, um, basically uh, saw uh, India's role not in terms of India's ability to um, directly shape events in East Asia, but rather uh, with the premise that um, a multipolarity uh, within the broad Asia, Indo-Pacific region was in our interests, uh, more so than a bipolar, an emerging bipolarity between the US and China, because most of these other big poles um, are generally uh, uh, in favor of the rules of the road. Um, we had a senior level strategic dialogue with the Chinese counterparts who um, completely recognized this and told us that they assessed India's future as one that would be very frustrating for us, <laughs> check, <laughs> but that uh, U.S.-India alignment, though slow and incremental and frustrating over the long term, was an assumption Chinese planners had. Not alliance, but, 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 but not a divergence for certain. And I think that's important. The other thing is Malay um, Malaysia. In Southeast Asia, Thailand is worrying, but I think the future of Burma as uh, Myanmar, I don't know what you guys are calling it today. <laughs> okay, thought so. Um, yeah, I think that's very, very important. Uh, 50 million plus um, uh, really could start to shape the heart and soul uh, of ASEAN, notwithstanding the external variables that Gary Ruffett pointed to, because what's happening in the Middle East will have a, also a very profound effect on the stability of, of ASEAN states. Uh, time for two more very quick questions, and I hope they're directed at one person, starting with Russell and then the gentleman in the corner. Thank you. Um, terrific panel. Thank you all for your contributions. Uh, I, I had two questions, I, if I may. Um, the, the, one, of the, one of them, they, they, in fact, they, they both build on Ernie's uh, question in a way. The, the first is directed to, um, to the whole panel, and, and that is we, we've spoken about... <laughs> well, <laughs> you can make a choice, Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the, in the idea of the, the strategic environment we're talking about here. Now, we've, we've, we've gone through East Asia, Asia Pacific. Uh, Rich Armitage, early in, this, 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 in his contribution, talked about uh, Indo-Pacific. That, that term is being used more often. And I'd be interested in, in an, an A person's view, or if and there are maybe conflicting views on the panel, as to whether or not we should be talking about Indo-Pacific or whether we should be talking about Asia Pacific. What, what's the, the, the particular strategic environment here? And I, and I wanted to press, uh, secondly, uh, Mike on his proposition in relation to the possibilities of increasing cooperation and cohesion within Southeast Asia, because it strikes me that the, the one area where there has been some confusion and reluctance in relation to the rebalances in, in Southeast Asia, and it seems to me that's the prospect that's really difficult. Well, the Indo-Pacific, uh, Andrew can explain it because that is the Australian Government's formulation. And, uh, and then, obviously, the, the second uh, question goes to the person it was directed to. I'll be um, very brief. I mean, I, I think we are using the term Indo-Pacific because we see increasingly a region that has growing strategic logic. Um, if you look at the economic ties between uh, the Middle East and running into... Um, East Asia through the Indian Ocean and increasingly uh, on the mainland, uh, we think there's, um, there's a logic to looking at the world that way. We're not saying that that logic applies equally strongly uh, 
in every respect, but, but we do think it is making sense. And if you look at Australia's position, I think understanding uh, that we are, I think, increasingly strategically prominent um, because of those changes, um, it makes sense for us to, to talk about the region that way. We learned at the ASEAN Regional Forum in Phnom Penh that when uh, states within ASEAN are weak in terms of governance, legitimacy, um, uh, they're more vulnerable to influence from Beijing. In that case, Cambodia, sometimes it's Laos, it, it could be Thailand, uh, depending on what happens uh, there. <coughs> um, we're always going to have one or two ASEAN states, or three or four, that are vulnerable, weak, divided, that, that we have problems with over these issues that will be more open to um, strategic influence from China. The economic relations with China are fine. It's when, it's when um, Beijing uses that uh, or uses coercion to try to divide ASEAN up and exert broader strategic in, in influence against our interests in the South China Sea and elsewhere. So we're always going to have this problem. But I think if the core ASEAN states, um, uh, most of them, are confident and um, uh, talking together, we're in much better shape. Um, and so that's why on balance, I think in strategic terms, I'm, I'm more optimistic than pessimistic about ASEAN. In terms of individual ASEAN states, we should be very worried about Thailand. Um, Myanmar looked good. Now um, there are more challenges. But as a strategic proposition, we have more of a chance to do what the U.S. really wanted to do in 1951-52, which was complement the San Francisco Treaty System, Australia-Japan, with a collective security or at least collective um, diplomatic relationship among the newly independent Southeast Asian states. We're closer to being able to do that than we've ever been, despite the challenges. Thank you. Last question, the gentleman in the corner. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, Chris Nelson, the Nelson Report. Uh, hi, Mike, over the, over the thing. Um, something you said prompted my question. Um, uh, I just finished reading uh, Ari Hatta's 1941 uh, a almost blow-by-blow blow account of every mistake our Japanese friends made, every mistake we made, and the lesson I drew from it, aside from smashing my forehead every, every second page, was that we never quite said what we really thought. They never quite said what they really think to each other in their own meetings, and the result was we never really got on the table what, uh, uh, what we were up against and, and what we might be able to do together. There probably is a lesson there today. And given uh, something of a panel consensus that we're anywhere from a 25 to 50% chance of a dangerous clash uh, out there, uh, are there things we should be saying or ways we should be saying what we're saying about our real alliance commitments to Japan and the Philippines especially? Uh, do we need to be more explicit about the territorial claims? Do we need to be more proactive about trying to reach a solution uh, or, uh, and this is always the, the problem, isn't it? Do we need to do more, say more? If so, uh, what? Thank you. Uh, I have to say, Chris, the embassy lives on your newsletter. So uh, we look forward to seeing how you reflect on all of this uh, tonight. <laughs> right, OK. Michael. <laughs> well, every, everyone should feel free to answer this. I earlier due to lack of coffee, not the weaknesses in the American public education system, said it was the Hoover administration. It was actually the uh, Roosevelt administration, of course. Uh, but it's even more damning, because FDR had been Assistant Secretary of the Navy, was a student of Mahan, um, reportedly on his honeymoon with his new wife, Eleanor, on a cruise ship, would sneak over and sit next to some Japanese officers on the boat to listen to what they said. So it's all the more striking that we were not able to send these signals to Tokyo, that we were not internally um, uh, cohesive. I don't think the US or Australia or anyone should suddenly say we're siding with Japan or the Philippines on the territorial issues. That would, in a way, contradict our, our uh, commitment to the rule of law. These things need to be settled through international norms and, and uh, diplomacy. We have to be clear, though, about our views of coercion. Um, the vulnerabilities that we had before World War II in terms of the lack of internal consensus on this in the US are still there to some extent. Um, the fact the Japanese couldn't speak clearly was because they didn't have a consensus. I think that probably would characterize Beijing today. I wouldn't overdraw the scenario. We're not going to war, but there are definitely some lessons. Well, thank you very much. I, I won't pass that to the rest of the panel because I think the time has come for you to have coffee and also, before you do, to thank what has been a really excellent panel and a presentation. <laughs>